Hey everybody, we have huge case logs in the USCIS, 9.5 million. We have huge case logs in the immigration court, 1.7 million. We have huge case logs at the State Department, which sets out consulate interviews. Around 400,000, though I suspect it's much higher. So, 9.5 plus 1.7 gets you to what? 11.2 plus another half million, give or take, at the State Department gets us around 11.7. So, roughly speaking, there's close to 12 million cases that are backlogged right now with more papers being filed every single day. The new USCIS director, or M. Jado, probably butchering that. My name is always butchered. It's not true that people who have complicated names don't butcher other people's names because they have an innate respect for figuring out how to pronounce them. Sometimes you just glance at them and guess because time is limited and life is short. But life is short, right? And we have a backlog of 12 million cases that affects how many millions of people out there with immigrant family members or would-be immigrant family members? People who can't work, people who can't go to school, people who are stuck in the United States, people who are stuck outside of the United States. So what are some strategies to deal with these backlogs? What are some tactics? Let's talk about it after the break. Everybody, here's, here's the bad news. The bad news is that uh, the backlogs are so large, in part because USCIS has been stripped of many of the tools that it used to have, like a functional workforce, to help them get through those backlogs. And so a large part of what needs to happen is that over the next several years, the Biden administration, and before probably the inevitable return of a Republican administration, there needs to be a scale up of USCIS hiring that can actually handle all these cases. Moreover, USCIS needs to go do a full internal review of its systems, which were put in place during the Trump administration to flat out limit uh, immigration through bureaucratic warfare. So we're talking about additional forms that have to be filed, most if not all of which have been stripped away. Uh, the uh, inability to contact USCIS directly, which was something that was explicitly pursued by Stephen Miller and co. So for example, many of you might be familiar with my InfoPass video, just say InfoPass to get to a live USCIS agent. We didn't used to have to do that up until about 2018, which you could just talk to a live USCIS agent. We could just set up an info pass appointment to go talk to someone live at a local USCIS service center. It saved a whole bunch of time for our clients and for people. And uh, when that was done away with, with this automated system, this Emma, that's never going to happen. Emma is never going to happen. This is not a live chat bot. It's just, it's just a stupid automated, uh, you know, tree of, of decisions that that thing is making it stupid. Emma, stupid USCIS. It's never going to happen. Anyway, right now, USCIS still wants to happen. They have to do away with it. You know, they just have to hire more people so we can talk to them, so we can interact, so that we can actually get our stuff done because nobody cares more about their case than you do. And I do. And other people who represent you do. Hopefully, some don't, some do. And then we also have a lot of people that are having to renew constantly things like work permits. They're having to renew constantly things like TPS. The fact that all these forms of one particular kind go into the system every year or even two years just causes the backlogs of, of the bigger cases to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. USCIS flat out admitted there's no way they can turn around a work permit in six months. There's no way that they can turn around um, some other cases within timelines that will keep people in status, All right, So that is a broken system. So something that has to happen again is just more hiring and uh, the stripping out of all of these artificial but very effective barriers to immigration that have been put in. It doesn't mean they're not gonna be put back in later because uh, ultimately I think we have to take the immigration agencies out of the political arena and out of the executive branch but that, that's what in theory has to be done. But what does that mean that you can do? So I've been on record saying that one thing you need to do is not let go of the case. You need to bite into it and you need to fight for it. Fight, 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 fight. You also need to prepare it, you know, the right way when you're going in initially. So uh, making, that you, making sure that you have robust filings because the days of putting in skinny filings and then hoping to supplement them are long gone. There's 9.5 million cases in the backlog. Where do you think your paperwork's gonna go? Does it, do you think your paperwork is received by a very friendly, 
uh, secretary of sorts who then he uh, takes your file that you've sent in and he takes it and he files it neatly with all of your other stuff, which is just within reach. No, these things are sitting in warehouses all over the country and it's not obvious that USCIS knows where all files are at all times. I can tell you, G28s, which are the forms that we put in as lawyers to represent people, are lost all the time. Things that go along with an application are lost all the time. So, filing robustly and correctly the first time is important. Okay. And then when you get your case in, fighting for it through to the end is important. Okay, Damien, Damien, Damn Jan, whatever your name is, you can't even pronounce the USCIS director's name. Why should we care about your name? What else can we do? Well, in theory, again, you can do things like call USCIS. There's also a USCIS ombudsman, ombudsman. Ombudsman, I think is the term, which is something that we like, it's the first time I heard it was on ESPN. Uh, when, when somebody said something crazy, I think Stephen A. Smith saw a woman getting punched on an elevator by a football player and his first utterance out of his mouth was like, yeah, but what did she do? It's like Stephen A, there's nothing she could have done that justified that. And then they said, well, we had an ombudsman look at this and we decided that it was inappropriate, but we can do X, Y, Z. This is what we'll do to correct the situation. So an ombudsman is essentially like a referee for an organization, in this case, the USCIS. And so if you feel like you're not getting a fair shake because your application is taking too long or because some documents that you filed, the USCIS saying are not filed, la 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 la, you can contact the ombudsman. The link is here, whatever, somewhere, here, Santiago, here, 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 here. I don't know, here? I don't know. He's gonna put it up somewhere. And uh, the way you spell it is like here, 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 here. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Um, so you have the ombudsman that you can contact. Beyond that, you can write directors of USCIS field offices directly. Okay, so you can write your field office directly. You can't call them directly. There's one phone that goes to all USCIS, uh, to the USCIS central call center, but you can write directly to the USCIS office where your case is. What you might write is going to depend on the situation, but if you know where your case is resting in a particular field office, you can write them directly and say, hey, blah, 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 blah is going on, okay? Next thing you can do is you can uh, implement a congressional inquiry. So you can use one of your House of Representatives or you can use one of your senators in your state to, uh, you, their offices have, must have by law and all do have uh, methods of putting in an inquiry on your behalf about a particular application. For employers, if you have good relationships with politicians, for example, it might be good to, you know, let them know about an application problem that you're having so that that person kind of can kind of inquire even informally of, about what's happening. Family members, it, what they're going to do is write a letter on your behalf where you're going to provide most of the content asking what's happening with the application, okay? Then you can ask for expedites. You can ask for expedites if you have particular uh, facts uh, in your favor. So if you're filing a 601A and you've been waiting for an interview for your spouse for a long time and you have a medical procedure coming up, maybe you're giving birth. Uh, we've used giving birth to twins before. Uh, maybe you've broken an arm. Maybe you are removing, uh, you know, uh, an organ, no matter how inessential, that sort of stuff can be used to try and expedite the application. And then finally, one other big thing you can do is sue, sue, sue. Uh, you can sue at the federal level if you've been waiting for a long time. Whether this is gonna be effective is highly dependent on where you are in the country, uh, what district court you're in, and it's definitely something you wanna talk to an expert who's not at this point me. I talk to those experts on this sort of a lawsuit all the time, but you wanna to talk to them to see if, if it makes sense for your application. Okay, so that is kind of, that is, that is what you can do. Practically speaking, a lot of you can't do anything. If you're at the Texas Service Center and you have a 485 pending, I looked, I tried. Uh, there was a flurry of lawsuits were filed in 2021. They all failed trying to accelerate the processing of something like a 485 adjustment of status petition. Uh, and because of the backlog, all you can really do, unless maybe you're really sick or there's some other extremely pressing unique reason is wait, and that's frustrating. Um, if you are filing for a work permit, all you can really do right now is wait. I know the processing times are long. So where does that leave you? Well, it leaves us in a position where we are simultaneously have to fight for everything every inch and we have to wait on the USCIS to reform itself. And the USCIS, to their credit, has announced 
that it is looking to hire. So there's thousands of open positions that they're looking to fill. They've announced a new premium processing service uh, that's going to expand to application outside of some uh, very key employer applications. And they've said that they've announced new internal goals for processing, which could see things like naturalizations and family adjustment petitions eventually processed in as little as six months, which is where we kind of were in the early 2000s. So they're gonna go back to as good as they were in the early 2000s when we had even less technology. But anyway, that's what they're gonna to try to do. I'd settle for, you know, some basic technological competence and e-filing, but you know, I don't get to make the decisions. All in all, you know, where I sit on this is take a little extra time at the beginning of your application to file it correctly, uh, file it robustly, meaning put in everything that's needed and then when it's time to go back and forth, whether it's requests for evidence, uh, whether it's at an interview, uh, make sure that you're prepared. And beyond that, if you're trying to accelerate it, use what I talked in this video. So I hope this has been good. This was a nice little discussion. You know, there's a link to this announcement of what the USCIS is doing to accelerate, uh, trying to accelerate processing and uh, have a good, good day. Have a great day.